Um, so we're extremely happy to have you here today, Sarah, and um, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Jan, for the kind introduction invitation. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I've already had a fantastic day spending time mostly with the students, and uh, I'm very impressed both by the quality and the motivation of the students and also by the facilities, so I hope to be back to also utilize some of your fantastic expertise here. Yeah, so basically, my lab is trying to understand how biological inf information is transmitted across scales. And by uh, across scales, I mean really from the molecular mechanisms by which single cells establish and maintain their fates to how then single cells interact with each other to coordinate their fates in space and time, in, in dynamic cellular systems, and how these groups of cells then go on to organize into these hierarchical uh, uh, functional organs. And of course, we know that this organ architecture and structure feeds back all the way again to, to the molecular states. And our leading hypothesis is that the communication might occur through integrating mechanical and biochemical signals. And, and basically, the leading kind of paradi paradigm why we try to examine is that if we now start here from the scale of the tissues is that the tissues obviously have architectures that uh, force the cells to exist in certain densities, uh, packing topologies, and also mechanical states on the tissue scale. So the tissue might exist in a more fluid-like or a, a solid-like state. And, and this type of tissue scale properties then communicate to single cells and instruct what kind of shapes and, and adhesive properties they might have, as well as, the, as their mechanical properties, which of course rely on these two. And then these mechanical cell shape and adhesive changes communicate to the nucleus then to actually regulate transcription. And I will show you some examples how we kind of explored this continuum of communication in our systems. So the main model we are using to, to understand this kind of uh, communication across scales is the mammalian epidermis, so that's the epithelial component of the skin. So we think in many ways it's actually a very ideal model system to study cell and tissue dynamics. So it originates in the embryonic development from the single layer of surface ectoderm that then commits to a keratinocyte lineage. And then after that, single cells break symmetry and enter a terminal differentiation pathway during the, which they also move upwards. And each layer represents a further terminal differentiation state. And the final state is this kind of controlled death where the cells also cornify to form this kind of dead cornified layer on the surface of the skin. And this then constitutes a life essential barrier. So basically, if the skin barrier doesn't work, we will be dead in, in some hours. What is interesting is that this dynamics continues throughout our lives. So every day we actually shed millions of cells. So we are actually, when you're vacuuming your bed bedroom, actually most of the dust is, is dead skin. So these millions of cells need to be obviously replaced by new material, which is then contributed to these stem cells that now in the mature tissue get restricted to the basal layer. So they provide then through their self-renewing and differentiating divisions material for this cell loss. What is further interesting is that the system not only has to be dynamic, but also flexible. Because beyond developmental growth, skin is obviously one of the few tissues that needs to be dynamically changing its size during adulthood. And it's also a frequent site of injuries that needs to be efficiently repaired, after which homeostasis needs to be reestablished. So it's clear that the kind of the differentiation programs cannot be genetically hardwired. They have to be somehow sensitive to understanding what are the needs and the changing needs of the tissue every day. And, and as mentioned, we kind of imagine that mechanical signals would be now perfectly positioned to communicate this tissue scale information, for example, through providing mechanical signals to this stem cell layer here. Now, we are not the only ones who have been using the skin epidermis to actually understand cell dynamics. So actually, the skin and its hair follicle have been one of the most successful organs to identify and, and study tissue resident adult stem cell behavior. So, so there's a bunch of groups in, in the field who have very successfully applied lineage tracing to understand what is kind of the population scale dynamics. So lineage trace, in lineage tracing, you basically genetically permanently label single cells, and then you follow them over time, and you basically use mathematical models to compute colony size and distributions to kind of model population level stem cell behavior. 
And, and the outcome of this magnitude of work is that actually the homeostatic principle is fairly simple. So a stem cell can obviously self renew and differentiate. So these are now population level behavior. So whether a division is so-called asymmetric division where the cell fates are propagated within this division, that is not clear. But what is clear is that the stem cell can differentiate and, and it can self renew. And if there's a need for lateral tissue expansion, for example, during postnatal growth, then the equilibrium between the self renewing differentiations that will expand the stem cell pool versus the differentiating behaviors that will shrink it are biased towards these self renewing divisions. And now, when the final tissue size is reached, then basically the system kind of just equilibrates into a 50 50 balance. So basically, stem cell loss is substituted by a stem cell expansion, and you have this kind of equilibrium state behavior. However, uh, in, in collaboration with Cedric Mampan, who is applying these lineage tracing approaches, we actually noticed that when we then follow such an individual clone, it's actually not growing isotropically. So here, you, this, this red uh, thing here is, is one of the stem cell clones, so we have labeled one single cell, and now this clone is, is about 100 cells, and we see that the clone actually has this anisotropic shape. But when we look at the global body axis of growth, it's not aligned in, in that axis, so it's not sensing kind of the global growth of the entire organism, but it actually is locally aligned along these collagen fibers. And what is interesting here is that the cells are not in co direct contact with the collagen because there's this basement membrane in between the stem cells and the collagen fibers. And, and since we know that the collagen fibers actually provide the tensile strength for the tissue and, and align in the direction of tension, what we hypothesized is that they actually the growth is actually guided by the local tissue tension. And we showed this in vitro, and so have other labs, is that actually if you have uniaxial tension, cells will divide in that direction to kind of relieve this tension. So from this kind of correlative slash causative experiments in vitro, we already kind of started to hypothesize that probably local mechanical signals are very important for the stem cells to guide their behavior. So we started kind of studying this mechanistically in a bit more detail. And the another thing why we like the skin epidermis is that we can actually culture it in a very simple 2D culture system because it's naturally a 2D tissue. So actually the skin stem cells, the epidermal keratinocytes were the first adult stem cell to be ever cultured in vitro. And, and they are a very robust, easy culture system. And, and we can actually induce differentiation just by elevating the calcium in the medium. And what will happen is that they will stratify. So the stem cells will form one, two, or three even superbasal layers. So we can use this like very simple reductionistic system to look at the cells, what happens when the stem cells are dividing and growing and differentiating. So, so Kate Mirshnikova, actually a bioengineer and, and a former postdoc in my lab, she now has her own lab at the NIH, she decided simply just to image the cells when they are forming this first superbasal layer. And then she noticed something quite striking. So when the movie kind of starts from the beginning, you will, you will see that initially this confluent monolayer undergoes these very large scales, coherent flows. And this is now something that a physicist might describe to be fluid-like behavior. So basically, if you exert a force, all of the molecules will flow into one direction. And now what is interesting is that when we apply calcium, after 24 hours or so, these motions really come to a very abrupt halt. So the motions stop being coordinated and they also overall slow down. So it seems that this tissue is undergoing this kind of mechanical phase transition from a fluid-like to a jam, solid, glassy-like state. And what is intriguing is that this is not contact inhibition of growth because actually the cell divisions will continue beyond this, this jamming stage. However, what will start around the same time is this delamination behavior. So basically single cells now starting to move upwards. So we seem to have this correlation between the mechanical state of the tissue and now single cells starting to actually move upwards instead of staying in the monolayer. So we started asking, is cell density and, and the mechanical state of the monolayer an important factor actually causing differentiation and upward movement? Now to test this, we designed another type of crowding experiment where we cultured the stem cells now on a st stretchable elastomer and we stretched it statically 120% of its original surface area. And then we abruptly released this tension to kind of cause this lateral compression and, and kind of abrupt increase in cell density. And indeed, if we now look at just on the RNA levels 
of the differentiation genes, we can see that this crowding experiment is, is really sufficient to actually trigger the transcription of all these late differentiation genes in the stem cells. And it, it's not an effect of some sort of substrate buckling, because if we do the same experiment with subconfluent monolayers, we don't see this effect. So it's, it's clearly something to do with, with the kind of the lateral confinement of the cells. And interestingly, if we just look in steady state, without the stretching, we can see that the expression of the differentiation genes really kind of scales with the cell density. So obviously, the higher cell density, the more differentiation. These seem to be quite simple. And then we started asking, what is, what is exactly what the cells are feeling? What, what is kind of the geometry that predisposes them to differentiation? And, and to, to test this question, we, we then decided to confine the cells in a little bit different way. So we did this kind of, and now I'm almost embarrassed to show this for, for this audience, since you do much fancier things. But we use basically deep UV lithography just to generate this kind of adhesive microislands. But the nice thing about this is that we basically can design very easily using photomask what kind of geometries we would like. And we decided to design two geometries that have the exact same surface area, and hence they occupy approximately the same amount of cells on average. But due to these corners of the squares, we hypothesized that now we would actually also force the cells to elongate and, and generate this kind of stress anisotropies that we also see in vivo, where we see this differentiation. And, and strikingly, indeed, this very subtle change of the geometry where we force the cells to elongate in addition to restricting their cell matrix uh, adhesive area, we can further push the germ terminal differentiation. So our current kind of understanding is that the cells are sensitive to two parameters, restricting the cell substrate adhesive area, but also forcing them to elongate. So they are somehow sensing this type of mechanical stress and, and translating this into um, differentiation. But of course, in the end, for the cell to go from the stem cell state to the differentiated state, they somehow have to change their transcriptome and proteome. And to understand what would be the mechanosensitive pathways that control this state change, we, we decided to, to look at the RNA. And then Hui Li, a former PhD student in the lab, actually decided to just try to identify mechanosensitive transcriptional pathways. And instead of crowding, he decided to do the opposite. So he's doing stretching now, again, using the silicon elastomer system. And, and he kind of thought that maybe with the stretching, because actually it's interesting, if we image the skin live, we see this kind of cyclical oscillation of the skin. So he kind of hypothesized that the cyclic stretching would mimic this kind of signal for the tissue to expand. And then he did a simple bulk RNA sequencing experiment. And when we got these results, we were actually quite shocked because instead of having few genes up and few genes downregulated, what we saw was kind of thousands of genes being downregulated, but with relatively moderate fold changes. And, and since we had spiked in this ERCC reference RNA, we, we could quantify the RNA changes. And we can see that in the stretch cells, there was around 10% overall less mRNA than in the control cells. So it more pointed out that we're seeing some sort of global transcription repression in this scenario. And indeed, if we now do some bioinformatics analysis and, for example, do some gene set enrichment analysis where we basically survey databases of other people's transcription experiments and try to find perturbations that most closely resemble basically the gene set that we find downregulated. In fact, all of the hits were, were related to one single pathway, which was the polycom repressive complex 2 pathway. So the polycomprepressive complex 2 is a methyl transferase pathway that is actually involved in gene silencing. So what is interesting is that this is a pathway that catalyzes the trimethylation of histone 3 on lysine 27, usually occurring on promoters, gene bodies, and it's thought to kind of compact the chromatin and prevent transcriptional activation. And further, it typically is silencing lineage specification genes. So in stem cells, differentiation genes are silenced by this pathway and in differentiated cells, the stem cell genes and, and maybe some non lineage genes. So this was pretty interesting for us. We see global transcriptional repression, and then we see that somehow the genes that are being downregulated are related to this epigenetic pathway. So, so we decided that uh, let's dig into this a little bit deeper, although at that point we had no clue about epigenetics around uh, 10 years ago or so, and, and it's been a pretty fantastic journey. So if you ever find something weird, I, I encourage you to pursue it. So we started simply by first looking at whether it's true, whether we have transcriptional repression and increased histone occupancy on, on this 
particular histone 3 lysine 27. And indeed, we see a quite uh, dramatic change. So in the stretch cells, we have more H3K27 trimethyl, and this goes hand in hand in single cells with less transcriptional elongation, as we can detect by looking at the serine 2 phosphorylated form of the RNA pol 2. And, and so in both controls and, and stretch cells, there is this correlation. So the more silencing, the less transcription, but overall there's, there's less of, of transcription in, in the stretch cells. So then there's, of course, the chicken and the egg question, which come first, the transcriptional repression or the silencing. So we did a heroic effect, effort of like a bunch of cheap qPCR experiments to look at this. And indeed, we see that within hours, and now we know that this is basically chip, so looking at the modifications on the DNA label, but the immunofluorescence, we actually see this happening within minutes. So we think that the transcriptional repression that happens is actually quite fast. We start detecting it also visibly. I don't know whether you see this, it's a bit dark, but we can see that within three hours, we detect nicely that there's less transcription at these polycomb target genes, which are the late differentiation genes, but also at these constitutive, so what you could, might call housekeeping genes. So they also have less transcription. And these are negative controls, so genes that are not being transcribed in our cells. And only after 12 hours, we start seeing the effect on the K27. And here now the scenario is a little bit different. So we seem to have this kind of global transcriptional repression. But if we look at the polycomb, the most substantial accumulation we see at the, at the polycomb target gene. So these are the late differentiation genes. We do see a little bit like a very minor increase at these uh, uh, constitutive genes. And these genes that are already silenced, they gain a bit more. And this is basically consistent with other people, such as Christian Helene in the epigenomics field, think that there's basically this competition of promoters. The transcriptional machinery and the epigenetic silencing machinery compete over the promoters, but the transcriptional machinery is stronger. So if, if transcription is high at a given gene, the polycomb is not able to compete and actually actively silence the gene. And only if the transcription is being slowed down, then the polycomb pathway kind of as an opportunistic pathway can come in and kind of permanently switch this gene off. And this, we think, is also happening here. And the reason why I think so is that also if we just block, chemically block transcription, we, we get this similar pattern. So we think that the mechanical stress is suppressing transcription, allowing the polycomb to come in and then basically silence the, uh, the target genes. And the cell biological consequence is that now these cells have a harder time to differentiate. So basically, we need a higher and stronger, basically, biochemical cue to get these cells that are being stretched to differentiate. So our very simple model at, at this point was that instead of kind of activating some specific pathway that regulates differentiation, what the mechanical stress is doing is kind of thresholding the responsiveness of, of a cell to a given stimulus. So in a way that if a cell is now being stretched is under high mechanical stress, there is basically high tension in, in the cell. So we obviously know myosin goes up, actin cytoskeleton is reinforced, and thereby the, the differentiation probability of this cell is low. Versus now a cell that is being confined, it has low levels of tension, low levels of uh, gene silencing, and thereby this cell is simply more likely to respond to the biochemical thing. And this, of course, an attractive hypothesis if we think about stem cell niches, because one would never want all of the stem cells to execute the same behavior at the same time, all of them to divide, all of them to differentiate. So basically coupling the responsiveness to tension could be a way to really kind of moderate and produce heterogeneous responses of homogeneous cells in, in the same niche. And we are kind of now trying to obviously investigate whether these type of mechanisms actually operate in the tissue. But while we were doing these experiments, we were still struck by kind of the strong effects of the histone modifications on, on the cells when we were doing the stretching. So we decided to look at this from a more cell biological perspective. And now I'm kind of detaching myself of, of the whole skin model so from now on, it's, it's pure cell biology. And we can discuss the relevance of, of this in, in vivo. And the answer is we don't know. So this is now really just trying to understand how cells basically respond to high degrees of deformation. So what we started to do is just to kind of investigate other features of the nuclear architecture that are responsive, responsive to, to stretching. And what we noticed was that in addition to this H3K27 increase, we saw a very strong change in another histone mark, which was H3K9 
dye trimethyl. And this is also a silencing mark, so it's also thought to compact the chromatin, and it's thought to kind of be even a stronger silencing mark. So HVK27 is more like a regulatable mark, whereas this K9 is really occupying constitutive heterochromatin. So heterochromatin that is not even dissolved during cell divisions, and it's also occupying genomic regions that are not transcribed at all, for example, transposable elements or really non-lineage genes. And what is the second interesting feature about this modification is that it's anchoring the chromatin to the nuclear lamina. And what we noticed was that when we do this cyclic stretching for 30 minutes, we see an increase in the K27, but we see a decrease in, in the K9 occupancy. And what was interesting when we looked, we did some chip sequencing, so we looked genome-wide where this decrease is happening. And indeed, we see that most of the down-regulated peaks are somehow happening at the non-coding areas, whereas these few peaks that are up-regulated upon stretching, they are actually enriched at coding elements. And the second interesting feature was that whereas the up-regulated peaks were really not enriched anywhere specifically on their own the chromosome lengths, the down-regulated peaks were really heavily enriched at chromosome ends, where we have the telomeres and subtelomeric regions, which are really high in this K9 modification and also frequently anchored to the nuclear lamina. So this was interesting because we seem to have this change, particularly in, in these kind of non-coding regions close to the nuclear lamina. So we asked, does this change actually have a strong transcriptional consequence? And indeed, we again did some RNA sequencing, but this time we looked at much earlier time points. So the previous experiment was 12 hours. And indeed, now we see a more nuanced view on the transcription. We are actually at 30 minutes. We do see upregulation of certain genes, which are related to actually cell-cell junctions and the actin cytoskeleton. So we have this transcriptional re kind of response to reinforce the cytoskeleton. And later on, we start seeing downregulation again of the epidermal differentiation genes, as well as also upregulation of the K27 components itself. However, if we now cross-correlate basically the changes in the K9 trimethyl mark and the RNA changes, we see basically very little to no correlation. So this suggested to us that the decrease in K9, in contrast to the K27 changes, did not seem to have a major impact on mRNA transcription. So the question is, is it doing anything? Is it important? And since we have this intimate interaction between the K9-modified heterochromatin and the nuclear lamina, we decided to look very carefully at the nuclear lamina. And here I'm showing some transmission electron micrographs, and, and the nuclear lamina in the control cells is labeled yellow, and here you can see this very densely packed heterochromatin that is associated with the lamina. And then strikingly, when we look at these 30-minute stretch cells, we can see that, there, first of all, there's much less of, of this heterochromatin in the periphery, and we start seeing these kind of undulations, like wrinkling of the nuclear lamina. So this made us think that we maybe actually we're changing the mechanical properties of the nucleus because we're detaching this kind of stiff polymer from the lamina, and also we seem to somehow maybe change the membrane tension. And indeed, if we measure the elastic modulus of the nucleus with AFM, we can see that there's this transient softening. So it's interestingly, if we continue stretching, it's actually restored and I will come back to that later. And the same is with the nuclear membrane tension, so we use these flipper uh, probes to measure the fluorescent lifetime of this probe at the nuclear envelope, and we can see that there's this kind of reversible, again, reduction in the nuclear membrane tension. So the nucleus seems to become softer and, and kind of has, have lower membrane tension. So the obvious question is, is it because of the chromatin? And, and first, we decided to kind of separately look at the chromatin rheology and in, in a bit more detail. So what we did was to tag the telomeres with CRISPR rainbow. The telomeres were kind of the most affected regions coming from the chip sequencing data. So we can now image their, their mobility in live cells, and we can do that after stretching or in controls. And indeed, if we now plot the mean square displacement of these regions over lag time, we can see that there's this increase in chromatin mobility. So the chromatin also kind of becomes more softer, if you will. And, and to ask if this K9 change is, is causative to the change in, in the nuclear and, and chromatin rheological properties, we did kind of a sledgehammer approach where we overexpressed the methyl transferase that is responsible for catalyzing this methylation. This is SUV39H1, so we kind of fill the cells with the K9 trimethylated histone. And indeed, if we do that, first of all, without stretching, we can decrease the chromatin mobility, so clearly the K9 is doing something to kind of stiffen the, the chromatin, and also we can completely prevent the nuclear softening if we over SUV. So this suggests 
that the chromatin and probably also its interaction with the lamina is important for the nuclear mechanical properties. But of course, then might, one might ask, is it important for the nucleus to change the mechanical properties upon cyclic stretch? And of course, there's ample literature from the cytoskeleton showing that, that for the cytoskeleton, this is very much true. So the cytoskeleton will modify its mechanical properties to be kind of ideally suited to deal with a given force environment. And we started thinking maybe it's the same with the nucleus. So the nucleus might have ideal mechanical properties for steady state, which in the skin would be basically have load bearing properties. So as having a stiff nucleus might be beneficial in the skin, skin stem cells or cells that are cultured on very stiff cell culture plastic. And this is contributed by high lamin A levels, but also this uh, K9 attached to the nuclear lamina. And now when we have the cyclic stretching, maybe actually stress distributing properties would be more beneficial to kind of dissipate the mechanical energy. And this might be kind of contributed by releasing the heterochromatin from the lamina and also forming this kind of perinuclear actin ring, which we also see happening kind of maybe to stabilize the nucleus. And, and basically work had been coming out from several labs, Matthew Peel's lab, Jan Lammerding labs, that when cancer cells undergo extreme confinement, they actually can experience DNA damage because of this deformation, sometimes even nuclear rupture where the chromatin is leaking into the cytoplasm. So we thought that maybe this change in nuclear mechanical properties is actually somehow important to maybe protect this from happening. And indeed, if we stretch our cells, and 40% is quite a big deformation, we actually never see nuclear rupture or DNA damage to, to that end in our cells, suggesting that actually the keratinocyte stem cells are quite capable of dealing with this kind of large-scale deformations. However, if we now prevent the nuclear adaptation by overexpressing SUV, and now I'm pretty sure you will not see it, so this is gamma H2X, a marker for DNA damage. In these cells that overexpress SUV, we start seeing DNA damage. So that's why we hypothesize that this reduced nuclear stiffness and possibly also the change in membrane tension is a mechano adaptation that basically prevents DNA damage and, and nuclear rupture from happening in these cells. The final question was, what, what could be the mechanism? I'm not going in this into detail, but intuitively, and this is also experimentally true, we see nuclear deformation actually occurring. So there's this elastic deformation of the nucleus in the direction of deformation. And, and this actually coincides with an increase in intracellular calcium. And by, for example, just compressing the nucleus, we can induce the same thing. So we deduce that the nuclear deformation is important. And, and basically, we know that the calcium is actually coming from the ER. We did a bunch of experiments. I'm just showing one here. So basically, we blocked ER calcium uptake by Tapsi Gargin, which will initially trigger the release of e all calcium from the ER and then prevent its reuptake. So here in the control cells, you can see, so each line is one cell, and this is intensity of cytoplasmic calcium. So every cell will increase their interest in the calcium levels in direct response to stretching. If we treat the cells with tapsigargin, they will release their calcium, and when we start stretching, this no longer happens. So we think that actually the ER is somehow also being stretched, and the calcium is, is coming from there. And through mechanisms that we don't understand yet, this calcium is absolutely required for this heterochromatin remodeling, and, and thereby preventing the DNA damage. But of, of course, the, the final thing is, what allows the cell still to kind of establish this steady state architecture? Because I showed that everything is reversible. We do three hours of stretching, heterochromatin is normal, nuclear architecture is normal. So how does this work? And, and actually, this stretching obviously is not a thing that we have invented. There's 10 years of literature on cell responses to uniaxial stretch. And it's well known that actually there's this alignment of cells, depending a little bit with cell type, but epithelial cells that adhere to each other will, when the stretch is persisting, they will kind of align perpendicularly to the re uh, direction of stretch. And this is also what happens in our experimental setup. And this is kind of coined a phenomenon of strain avoidance, where the cell is trying to minimize strain of, on its organelles, its actin, its uh, junctions. And we thought that maybe this configuration is also preventing strain from, from reaching the nucleus. And, and to test this hypothesis, we did a very simple experiment where we stretched the cells for 360 minutes to for, produce this fully aligned configuration. And then we basically did a re-stretch in the same direction or reoriented the direction of stretching with 90 degrees. Now the cells were all oriented in the direction of stretch. So having the worst po possible configuration. 
And indeed, if we now do the comparison of the nuclear deformation in this perpendicular restretch, the nucleus is no longer deforming, whereas in the parallel configuration, we have, again, this substantial nuclear deformation. And in fact, if we do this parallel stretching, the monolayer even kind of falls a little bit apart with these high strains, really showing how mechanoprotective this configuration is. We, these nuclear, perinuclear actin rings reappear, and we also get suppression of the K9. So, so basically, what we know now is that the mechanical stress responses operate really on multiple time and length scales. And, and we think that this kind of chromatin softening fluidification, many people don't like that term, but basically the change of the mechanical properties, we think are really kind of a relatively rapid protective effect that basically allows stress dis dissipation and kind of protecting the polymer from damage. And interestingly, it has been shown for the cytoskeleton also that upon large strains, the initial response is actually not strain stiffening, but rather a softening really as a, as a kind of an emergency uh, response to prevent failure. And then on longer time scales, we have these transcription responses where uh, the, the transcription is being repressed, and, and this allows transcriptional cell state adaptation. But of course, we know that this is not the only thing happening, that this strong transcriptional repression is masking these other pathways, which obviously are being activated. So of course, there's a bunch of known mechanosensitive transcription factors that become activated. And what is interesting is that they frequently actually promote the transcription of cytoskeletal genes. So basically what is happening is that we have this mechanical transcriptional reinforcement that happens to initiate the adaptation of the cells to enforce cytoskeleton and adhesions to be more mechanically compatible. And then if these high levels of stresses persist for hours, then you have this supracellular scale adaptations, for example, this monolayer alignment, which then basically allows the cells to shut down all of these other uh, kind of adaptations, which probably are not so sustainable, because obviously the heterochromatin is important for regulating the cell state, nuclear architecture, and so on. So, so these adaptations are probably the more long-term sustainable uh, way to deal with stresses, and they will elevate the threshold. And only if a, a mechanical stress now emerges that is higher, or maybe have, has a different direction, amplitude, or, or other types of changes, then the cells can reinitiate these other adaptive responses. And with this, I'll, I'll close. I want to thank all, all the fantastic people in the lab who have done all the work, in particularly the alumni, so Kate, Michele, Hui, and, and Leah, who did most of the published work. We've had fantastic collaborators without whom this would not have been possible. And uh, of course, I thank you for your attention, and we'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a great presentation. Um, I was thinking actually about using the microphone because we would also like to hear the, uh, the questions from the audience on the video which is being recorded at the moment. So I also suggested you repeat the question so that it's also recorded. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so are there any questions from the, uh, from the audience? Vito. Right, so, so the question was how this kind of mechanosensitive cell state changes still lead to the actual movement of the cell upwards and, and how the neighboring cells maybe adapt a different fate. So, so that's, a, that's a great question and I didn't have time to show some of our work, again in vitro, that we see that actually the cell fate change is also associated with the changes in the adhesive and mechanical properties of the cell. So basically when we, for example, trigger the cell fate transition biochemically, but also by mechanically, for example, by crowding, the cell will commit to differentiation, but it will also increase its cell-cell adhesions. It will upregulate specific coherence, which we think is allowing the cell to start migrating upward. And that would make sense that there's this kind of mechanochemical feedback loop uh, 
which then makes sure that the cell is also moving upwards. And then it could be that there's also, and we know from others, and we are also working on that there's, for example, notch signaling involved. That, so the differentiated cell has high notch, and that could also kind of biochemically, for example, laterally inhibit the neighboring cells from, from differentiating. Yeah. Right. So, so the question was because it's kind of counterintuitive that you have jamming and, and then you have upward movement, and that is absolutely right. So, but we think that you need the jamming to make the cells mechanosensitive, because otherwise, if you have a fluid-like state, nobody is really kind of sensing anybody's deformation. So, you need on the tissue scale this jamming transition. But indeed, we think, but it's hard to show in vivo that you still have a local fluidification. And the reason we think this is the case is because when we see delaminations, we often see them close to other cells dividing. And then this cell is also becoming softer. So we think that these divisions kind of locally fluidify the kind of a group of maybe four or five cells, and then indeed the energy barrier for this cell to move upwards. But it, it's kind of difficult to prove, but that's, that's what we're indeed thinking. Any other questions, Arif? Yeah, so I kind of, you, we use these terms uh, kind of interchangeably, but indeed it's kind of axial compression. So we didn't, so the only confinement experiment was kind of in the beginning where we, we did this kind of release of the elastomer. Yeah, so the question is whether we could induce kind of confinement in 3D by, by letting a sphere grow inside a stiff hydrogel or basically actively confined. Yeah, that's, that's something that we definitely are thinking that also could be happening in tissues because what is interesting in the skin but also in other tissues that during embry embryonic development, once you start building structures, the ECM is at the same time maturing and for example, it's a correlation right now, but w once we start actually stratifying in the epidermis, there's also a major kind of stiffening of the ECM, suggesting that indeed these kind of extrinsic mechanical constraints could somehow, through impacting crowding or jamming, kind of initiate or kind of speed up or influence morphogenic processes. So that's, that's definitely something that we are thinking about and, and kind of trying to gear up to do some of those experiments, yeah. yeah I also have a, a question about the, let's say, the, the, the very, very first signal that the cells feel. Um, so you said that it could be um, the, uh, the, the, the influx of calcium, or you've shown that it's influx of calcium. Um, the influx of calcium, of course, can be through things like the piezo uh, proteins in the, in the plasma membrane and or the proteins in the ER. So did you, did you also see whether um, modifications to the ability to actuate those channels also has an effect on the, on the compaction of the, of the chromatin? So for instance, if you make the, 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 the membrane less fluidic with cholesterol or other means eh, where you can make the membrane itself stiffer or less stiff, do you then also see an effect on, on the mechanosensing? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the question was whether we can basically uh, change the fluidity of the membranes themselves and change the mechanosensitivity. So we have not changed the membranes, but we have changed the cortical. So basically, the, because it has been shown that still, for example, the cortical actin, or in our case also the nuclear lamina, will kind of tune the mechanosensitivity. So if we manipulate those, we seem to be able to kind of tune the mechanosensitivity of the cells. So, of course, then what is the... What are the channels that are involved? We, we don't know, so that, that's clearly some key question. And what is kind of the direct 
downstream effect of, of the calcium influx, which is obviously a very generic signal. But so we are looking into this very actively, and we have some evidence that in fact it's the membrane cortex interactions or basically the membrane chromatin interactions because there's a lot of calcium sensitive plasma membrane binders that actually get recruited and, and then kind of change this interface. So that's where we are looking at now. Other questions? Helen? Yeah, so, so the question was whether diseases that affect the kind of the nuclear mechanics or organizations such as laminopathies, what, what they would kind of do to the mechanical responses of the nucleus. So that, that's again a very interesting question. What is, what is interesting is that we have colleagues who work on the epigenome of, for example, the hutchinson guilford progeria, and when they look at the K27 changes, they are actually very similar to what we see in the stretch cells. So again, this is hand-waving now, but that would suggest that they are kind of baseline mechanically stressed. And what we are looking at is kind of a similar response what they would be experiencing. And uh, we know that obviously they have nuclear fragility, so the prediction is, and we have some data, that they would then experience earlier nuclear rupture and, and so on. But whether they would then still display further this kind of mechanosensitive changes in, in the chromatin, we don't know, but kind of baseline, it seems to be quite similar, which is interesting. Any further questions? If not, then I would like to thank you again, Sarah, and please uh, join me. And with this, I would like to, uh, to end this uh, the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>